Miss Benedict. This video is really just um, kind of more on a on a, a dare, I guess. Uh, somebody threw down a challenge in the faceplant group about making cool brass sounds in faceplant, and he hasn't had much reaction. And he said the magic word brass. The answer is. <laughs> Yes, cool brass sound. Obviously, it's somewhat in the tradition of uh, Keith Emerson, a la um, touch and go sort of era. No, I'm not trying to play any of his pieces. But it gives us that huge, no longer a mini mug sort of a sound. What he used to do those, I, I actually really don't know. Could have been D50, really don't know, don't care. Part of the reason I rose to this challenge was simply because I realized as soon as I saw this person's post, I don't really use faceplant that much, which I'm aware of, but I haven't set about making enormous brass sounds. I would reach for Europa or Thor to do this, partly because I always reach for Europa and Thor, I am so used to them. But I did stop to think, why don't I reach for Faceplant? Because in theory, it's so much more capable. And as you hear, can do this really, really nicely. So to answer that question, I thought, well, let's see, how do we do this? Kind of thing and have it work. There is an easier ability in certain ways to do certain things here, but there is something that is harder. And to me, that's kind of fundamental to doing this kind of stuff and therefore actually reduces my desire to use faceplant. Uh, so while this is not picking on faceplant, I grab this to say, why is it that I do or don't use particular instruments? And in this case, faceplant, what stops me from using faceplant when I can do this kind of stuff so nicely. And it all comes down to the modulation. And the modulation is great. As you see, you can have lots of modulators doing lots of things. And you can wire anything to anything else. And, and all of that is really rather cool. It's so close to a, a, a a pluggedy modular euro racky kind of thing it's not funny obviously they have been aware of that whilst making it cool great wonderful so why do i have a problem with it well hey i'm old and blind and get worse every day um so i'm like a bat i, I live in darkness no it's not my vision's not that bad but it's not great when it comes to doing little things like this this film's not only overwhelming because you need the screen really big to be able to see anything therefore it's like sitting in the front row when you go to see aliens. Um, it's just a little headache inducing, but everything's so small and it's really hard to get fine details. So if I pick something, let's say grab this and then go over to something that's not being used. Um, I don't know, let's, let's say the mix here. Now this is so tiny, I'm really struggling to read. Assuming you can even work out where what I'm trying to read is on the screen. Uh, and I find fine adjustment in particular all but impossible to do. Now, okay, they're gonna say, well, you can open this up and type in a number. I don't wanna type in numbers. Uh, you can also grab this and start adjusting, but oddly enough, this isn't as fine as I want it to be. Um, yes, I can press shift and all of that, and it's, it's okay, but it's layers of, well, complexity that I don't really want. Now that's not to say that isn't gonna work for somebody else, but I just wanted an answer to why do I not grab this as often as I perhaps should when I can do this. So nicely. Okay, now the whole thing was about making a patch. Okay, it's done. We'll break it down a little bit. We'll pull off the effects. Obviously the effects are a pretty large part of the uh, the feeling here. Unison I only turned on just as I was going to do this, so the patch has been made. 
which is probably more how I would use it inside a piece. Obviously, if it's right front and centre, overpowering poor uh, poor Greg Lake, then it makes a lot of sense to do the unison-y kind of thing, but within a mix. This is going to behave a lot better. And if we pull back some of the excessiveness, then we do end up with a nice little trumpety sound. Obviously, tone, timbre, all of that depends on our filters to a great degree. If we were to have just the one oscillator, but a fair amount of this is these two oscillators working together. Yes, there's a little bit of detune, which is handled in a couple of places. One being the um, simple detuning here, the other being an envelope here, which gives a little bit of punch at the beginning. So for the moment, we'll turn that off. Let's just turn all of these off. And let's turn these off too. So we've got this filter envelope. Now filter envelopes obviously are going to dramatically change how our brass sound speaks. We get the blade runnery kind of thing, as does changing our decay and release in these situations as well. That's where we would want our um, keep pressing buttons here. To help fill in that sound. But that's mostly running our filter envelope. But there are a couple of other assignments as well. One is that reverb. It actually is pulling the reverb mix back just a little bit, so it's ducking here. But we're using this envelope because it actually matches the sound. If we created a third envelope, we could do that, but then it wouldn't be as related to the sound. We could use an envelope follower as the listening to the sound and ducking, but I've got this here. Why not re reuse that? There's no right or wrong. It's also being used to duck this main LFO. This is the main vibrato. And this is being used to duck that in the intro part of the sand. Because we've got other things going on, then we allow our sand to have almost two phases in terms of modulations. One is there's an initial set of modulations on attack, which we'll discuss momentarily, and then it settles into the vibrato. So seeing we've got this envelope and it matches a lot of that flow, then we can use it just to reduce the amount of vibrato at that time, and therefore it appears to come back up. And, yep, yeah, that's that. And the last one, obviously, is just the one I talked about before, the filter cutoff. So we can close that fella up. Turn vibrato off for the moment. We've then got this envelope. Can you hear this fruity little pop on the beginning? That is a pitch bend from this envelope on the beginning of the notes. And that's endemic to brass. So as we blow, we tend to overblow. And so if we're trying to be huge and give the impression of hugeness, the player is likely to overblow. If it's a very smooth legato kind of a line, then he's less likely to she, it, don't care. I'm not getting judgy on sexist on this kind of garbage, so you don't need to raise it with me. Uh, they will be a little less likely to really push into it. But when it's the big fanfare kind of thing, they will tend to overblow a little bit. And that is 
cool. So we're using that to raise the pitch, but I'm also using it to control this LFO here, which is a really fast LFO. We want to get up into a real fluttery kind of point, but we don't want that hanging on as into the sand because it's, well, it's cool and synthy. Very windy, Carlos. We just want that at the beginning. As we start to blow into a tin tube, there can be that little bit of a farty thing. Uh, and I believe horn players, depending upon the type of horn that they've got, cornets and things in particular, which have no, uh, will actually do that. And it provides this real grab of attack. And so you can use different shapes here to achieve kinds of different results. The square works nicely here. You just want to have plenty of that. And that's just assigning to both of these. And it wants to be fast. Because we're actually getting this kind of flap. So this is driving that envelope as well. In all cases, you'll see that my LFOs are always running bipolar. I'm not a fan of unipolar LFOs. Oh, did I just kill some modifiers? I do believe I did. Yes, I did. There we go, have them back. And then we've got this guy here, which is pure and simple modulating our delay. So if we turn our delay back on, that's in some ways more literally accurate to the um, touch and go era in that there wasn't as much modulating delay in the digital domain, assuming he was using a digital delay at this point and not using a, a trusty analog or semi-analog thing, or he could well have had a digital delay that uh, that modulated. Keith was rich enough to use studios that had anything he bloody well wanted. So for all we know, that could have been a, um, a Fairlight with half a brass sample in it. I don't know, nor do I care. But this emulates what was happening, not because I set out to say I'll do that, simply because, well, this is a super sound. So they are the layers of what's going on in there. Obviously a little bit of filter here. Depending upon your listening, it's more of a feel thing. I don't want to take away the lovely, you know, harmonic blaze that comes with this. But with that, a little bit of roll off, it actually starts to sound a bit thin and toppy digital. Uh, and so just that tiny little bit of will take the edge off uh, makes it sound a lot richer. Tiny bit of chorusing. And while we could do this at 100%, I would rather build that up in layers. Because one of the difficulties of doing this is that you, you bullet a gate and then down the track it's not going to mix as nicely. So by reducing the spread and reducing the mix, then we've got chorus, but we've still got the sense of that sound being very forward. Remember, as I said, I'd be more likely to use this sort of forward in a mix like this, maybe without though. So this is going to make it harder to mix. So by pulling back our chorusing 
and then I'm adding a little bit of ensemble, the same thing. Rather than just going, oh here, look, let's run everything at 11 and, and getting a pretty nasty result. I can say, let's add a little here and a little here. And they add just little tiny, barely perceptible, but feelable layers of ooh to that sound. Same as the uh, modulation of this delay line. And the reverb, obviously, in this case, just adds a lot of sense of grandness. But some of the sense of grandness is actually not the reverb. Here, how that just sounds kind of washy and it's not controlled. Uh, by adding this compressor on the other side, it's not doing a lot of work, but if we make it extreme, we can hear how it's pulling that down. Now, when we are in an environment that is really loud, and if we're in a, um, uh, if we're at Camelot and they're all suddenly going, then we are going to have that feeling of closing down. So our compressor's doing that for us. Only needs a little bit. And that actually gives us the impression of this space and this environment and the, the activity being way huger, being way cooler if I played nice notes. So that gives us that bigness that the reverb alone doesn't give. Or the same as if we were to take this, hear how the, the echoes and reverb are just kind of washy afterwards. So it's a combo of ducking this mix a little bit with that envelope and then making the whole thing push together and give that nice little kind of pump that we hear with our ears, which tells us very loud, dramatic, grand, epic. And we're there. So hopefully this um, muses you, gives you some ideas of where you can go with brass. Once you've got this basic structure done, You can apply it to anything. If we open up our first envelope, a lot of what makes brass is in that envelope mood. Brass often speaks very nicely with lighter filter. And if we want to get rid of that little pop on the front. Gives us a beautiful flowing brass which will sit in the middle of something. So we could have used um, key follow here and everything, but there's so many, so many layers that you want to do. Uh, that's one kind of way of looking at the timbre. I've never really gotten off on brass going backwards, but it can if you want. certain French person. Here have the two bowl, gives us a spittier sound. 
One loses some of that. I never know which way that works. Two. Three. Four. It's harder, but it's not as spitty. There's something just in nice balance here. That... Gives us this nice kind of spit. Uh, really, there's a host of things we can do. We can also invert this. going to make a really cool you know, use this little arpeggio. Or, or whatever, that's going to sit super nice and give real little cute excitement to something without sounding too um, Zelda. Um, you just got to play with these things and, and that's how you find what works nicely for you. too much on brass. I think it can get a bit icky. Actually, let's have a look at this global unison. Don't love it. Again, I don't love the unison because it reduces the, the singularity of that sound to sit inside a mix. Yeah, on, in solo, it's going to sound amazing. But it's it's better left for the kind of thing. Even there, you're reducing some of its impact. Um, that's probably more than plenty, more than most people wanted to watch. Uh, if you have any questions, obviously, ask them down below. Um, yeah, if you obviously wanted to hire somebody as a sound designer or as a mix engineer or to help you with uh, producing your records, to help you with making the right decisions, to getting things to where they need to be to work really nicely, practically, then give me a hoy. Uh, I'm pretty easy to find. You have a great day now.